Okay, we're recording. All right. So I start off all the time with this screen uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's at the front of the user guide. The user guide, which is available in French and English, is the best place to start when you're trying to get used to Open Food Network. And I know we have a, t we have a, a culture where we think everything should just be intuitive and we shouldn't have to read about it in user guides. Um, and I think the problem here is this isn't like a little simple app like you download on your phone and you play with and make it work. That's not what this is. It's not like integrating a square shop, which does one simple thing and does it well. Open Food Network is a broad platform with a lot of features and a lot of tools working for lots of different food systems on the ground. What makes this different from Square or Shopify or any of the other platform providers that you might be familiar with, they all take the perspective of a business or an enterprise, a farm, a co-op, a food hub, a buying club. We take that perspective, but we zoom out from that picture and imagine what would the entire local food system look like and how would all those different parts fit together. So because of that, you can understand it's a little bit more complicated. And the way to start out is to figure out what is it that I want to do now. And none of these decisions preclude changing later. So there are multiple ways that you can use OFN. One is you could just be visible on a directory. Um, and this means people can find you and they can connect with you and they can build things with you. So sometimes for a food system where a community is saying, gee, we re really should build a system here. We should really be doing something. How do we get started? What a great way to start. All the partners around the table create a visible profile in Open Food Network. It's just a first step. It's not, not going to end there, but it's a first step response and they can see each other and understand what each other does. So then from there you say, well, I actually want to sell products or distribute products because we have um, like food banks and food distribution projects on, on the network as well. So we tend to use selling language because most people sell. It's mostly market language. But whether you sell for zero dollars or whether you sell for ten dollars or whatever you sell for, it's the same process. So we, the next decision point here is what if I want to now sell products on Open Food Network? How do I do that? Well, there's three possible ways you could sell. One is I want to supply somebody else who's actually going to do the selling for me. So I'm a vendor at a farmer's market. The farmer's market has a multi-vendor store set up and I'm supplying them, but I'm not actually taking the money, I'm getting paid from the market. Or I want to sell my products through a food co-op. So I'm a supplier of a food co-op, the co-op is selling on Open Food Network and then they're going to pay me the cost of my products that sold. So you could sell through someone else. The second way is I want to sell directly myself. So I want to have my own shop, my own online store with my own products. I might be a farmer, I might be a baker, I might be a crafter, I could be really any kind of a maker. I have products and I want to sell them and so I want to set up my own store. And the third way is I want to sell my products but I also want to sell other people's products and that might be you know, two of my neighbors also make things. Two of my neighbors grow things in their community gardens and we want to sell this all together. Uh, neighbor farmers and I have decided to get together and we want to be a food hub or I'm, I'm a, a fairly large uh, group of people and I want to make a cooperative store here or I want to build a farmer's market here. This is like being a marketplace of multiple um, products here. So there's these three ways that you could get on to Open Food Network and you can move between them um, whenever you like. So I'm going to just show you now. Um, let me just get rid of that. When you're on the um, 
uh, first page, well, we're all joining from different countries, so let me just do this. I'm showing you the Canadian platform, which opens up like this, and it will be similar everywhere else because Open Food Network around the world uses the same code base on the back end. And it's an open source code base, so we have many developers, many contributors, always looking for more, always looking to make it better. And because it's open source, it's like a public infrastructure. It's non-proprietary. People don't own it. Uh, it's available to anyone who wants to use this code base. And those of us who are uh, set up on servers with this code base and the front end marketing images that you see around the world, we call ourselves instances or it's like being chapters and we work together uh, to offer this everywhere. So your picture, wherever you are of Open Food Network will look a little bit different, but the layout of everything I show you will be the same. Some of the words will be a little bit different. It will be available in different languages where you are. Here in Canada, we're in English and French. Um, I could click to the French, but I won't be able to do the de demo in French, so I will do the demo in English. And this funny thing happens when I go back to English after French, it, it, it gives me a Google translation at first, which is kind of funny because I'm an Anglophone reading a Google translation of of French and it, it, it always translates it quite funny but now I'm back to where I started so it's good. Okay so um, we open up like this with what we call the shop now button and if you click here what you see is a search screen where you can search by location this is for the consumer now or you can search by the type of food that you want and Actually, I should say, or you can search by, by property, organic, gluten-free, all these different properties. Um, and what you see on this screen is a partial listing of the people who are currently have shops open on Open Food Network. Not all of them are, are selling things. I'm sorry, not all of them are uh, food. Some of them might be selling other things. Um, and the thing about this page is these are just shops that are open right at this moment and um, have decided they want to be visible to the public. Not all shops want that because lots of times a group will have its own private um, marketing to private members. Maybe it's wholesale, for example, or maybe it has, it's a, a CSA farm that already has a member list. They don't need their members to find things here because their members already know the link to the shop and so forth. So this is the, the page of, of, of shops. Um, there's a map function uh, and the map function, of course, um, shows you all the shops. It, the map is by instance, so this is our Canadian map, and it's, as you can see, we're very clustered in southern Ontario here, although uh, gradually expanding elsewhere, which is very exciting. There's also a list of producers. The list of producers is a list of all the producers and suppliers on the network who have decided they want to be visible and be found. Um, when they're highlighted in red, it means they have a shop front open and so if we click there it automatically goes over to their shop um, they must have closed I was just looking jet guessing for a, a, an open one and I'm not sure Let's see they're closed too well we won't play So all of the shops that list here, you'll see they have the same kind of thing, um, their logo, their contact information, their social media, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have a function called groups, which is very popular right now with farmers markets in Canada. In fact, I think we're going to rename it markets right now, um, just because that's who's setting up here. So we have farmers markets, this is, um, they won't be open right now. I think just food market stand is open. Sometimes markets set up in these very infor informal ways um, where they have a list of just a few vendors. Each vendor has a different shop and we automatically go over to their shop, for example. This is a, um, 
a vendor who sells lamb products, etc. And the nice thing about this groups feature is that they can hang hang together um, in a in a group. You can have any number of groups, and you can be in any number of groups. So I'm going to start by um, just showing you an uh, an open shop, and then we'll go to the back end. So I'm going to show you. It's always a choice. Who do you want to see? Let's try Ambrosia Corner Bakery. Okay, so a little bit about them. Now here, um, the suppliers for Ambrosia are highlighted. Um, Ambrosia Pantry Items is a supplier, Sugar Daddies, St. Bitter Bangles. You see they have all these different producers in one shop. Um, producers have not yet uploaded photos, or this would be a photo of, of the item, and that's very typical. Producers can't kind of get on quick enough, it seems. Um, takes them a lot of time. Um, and so every shop says when the next ordering is. So she has one order cycle going on right now, and it's, it's uh, closing um, on um, May 2nd. She could have many others listed here, and you could choose. And sometimes this is a shop for a, a member, or it might be a wholesale versus retail shop. And you can tag these shops to different people so that only certain people see them, for example. You can search the shops by uh, product category. Um, and that becomes really important in large shops. I don't know how many products she has in this shop, but I know we have hubs with probably um, 800 products. So you need to be able to search uh, to find the products. You can just um, type in the product you want. So I was going to type in bagels and then bagels come up. You can also just type in um, the actual name of a, of a supplier. Now I don't know their suppliers, so I'm kind of guessing that I wonder if they sell berries. That I was right. <laughs> I just know where they're located, so I was kind of guessing that they supply that. Um, so in you can search by supplier, you can search by product, you can search by category. <clears throat> All of the shops are listing, it's a standard kind of e-commerce process from here on in. Um, you put the items in your cart, you edit your cart, at checkout you're presented, well maybe I'll just, you know, I don't want to mess her up, but I won't complete the checkout. At checkout, um, you're presented with the options for pickup, like actually getting your product, and for paying for your product. So after you complete who you are and your uh, details, and there is an option to check out as a guest, you'll see here it automatically pulled out an identity for me because it knows my login. So I've ordered before online, and so it remembers me. But if you were the first timer, it would give you the option to check out as a guest. Um, and here she's got several different de um, uh, delivery places. Some of them cost something, others don't cost anything, for example. So we would check one of those. And she has only set up one payment method, uh, the transfer. Um, and it's free to make an e-transfer. She might have put a credit card here and then um, it would assess perhaps a cost for the gateway fees here. In, in Canada, gateway fees are steep, 2.9% uh, plus 30 cents a transaction, so it adds up. So lots of times shop owners will pass that fee on to the buyer if they're going to take credit cards, or it could even be cash, although these days, of course, we're not doing cash. So there we are. She puts together her um, the, the shopper checks out the cart. I won't do that because it will actually prompt an order for her. I'm going to take a breath and see if there's questions about the consumer experience and then we're going to look at the back end. Um, my question isn't really about the consumer experience. Um, with my, oh sorry, I've got this silly cherry thing in the background. Um, it's wondering if it will be worthwhile to set people up as a directory as an initial step in Ireland before we get them involved with shops or hubs. Would that be a good first move? Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can do that. Um, it's not 
it doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to think about this linearly. You can start putting people on a, on a directory and then seeing if any of them want to actually move to a position where they set up shops and start selling. Um, we did that at one point for one community here in Canada. Um, we had a very large, uh, an organization that had a large map of the Waterloo Regional Food System and it had a, a list of yeah. many, many vendors already. And we entered them all as profiles and then we contacted them and say, hey, look at this, what do you think about this? Do you want us to leave mm -hmm. your profile up? So we actually get their permission. And um, most of them, of course, said, yes, of course, that's wonderful. And then, you know, a little while later, we said, so now all your profiles are here. Are any of you interested in setting up a store and selling products? And, yeah. and so then some people were. Um, so, yes, it's a way that you can proceed. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So when you first log in, you will see a dashboard that um, is a little different than this but it will have the same elements to it. Um, my dashboard, I'm just showing you what yours will look kind of like this. Uh, it will have your name uh, and this is where you can see yourself on the map and make sure that all looks fine. It will be, give you the option to edit your profile details, which basically um, controls how you describe yourself. I'll show you this and to edit at enter products and to manage order cycle, which is code for store, manage your store. So if I were to look at a profile here for this particular user, um, this is a profile that you can see is very short number of options, basically their address, their contact, contact info, what they want to say about themselves. Uh, do they want to upload a file for their image and so forth. And um, this is what we call a profile only vendor there you'll see there are no options here for things like taking payment methods or um, pickup and delivery for example um, because they're a profile vendor they're not actually setting up as a store so those options don't exist here if we go to um, across the, the top you can see the various options that uh, you can play with as a on the back end as a vendor. For example, you can choose to enter products. And so I'm just going to show you, I'm just, I'm a flower farmer, a cut flower farmer. That's what I do when I'm not wearing a headset, which isn't very often these days. Um, but this is a list of all my products. I'm actually getting ready for a seedling sale. So I've been entering products here. Um, you can expand every product has a couple of rows of information. I always get calls. People say, oh, I'm missing information. No, you're not. You have to expand the rows. This is a very important feature. You'll see this on several pages. This controls what information you see. Um, so I might get a call from this user who says, I want to change my tax category and I see no place to do that. I don't think that's possible. And I would say to them, yes, it's possible. You just have it hidden. So if you check it, there it is. So we use this because, um, and look at that. I, I found an item that should have tax. So I'm just going to fix it while I'm here because it would be a little goof because I need to charge tax on that product. Um, so the vendor, the, the producer enters all this information about their products and there's a description that they can can enter that shows up in the shop, etc. And it's detailed very clearly in the user guide how you enter, enter these products. Um, so that's under products. After you enter products, and you think, well, now I want to set up a store. So we do that under order cycles. And order cycles, um, you can see when they're green, it means someone has set up an order cycle already. So I'm just going down to this is my store, Garden Party. I have an order cycle set up and an order cycle has these um, same kind of uh, categories of information. Um, you need to give it a name. What am I going to call my order cycle? This is important because when you go to run reports on the back end, uh, it's a lot easier to do that if you had a, a nomenclature that you got used to using, that a set of rules that you followed 
to call your store different things. You set when the store is going to open and when it's going to close. <clears throat> you can set a store that's open for the entire year. You can set a store that's open for five years. You can set a store that's open for two days. It's totally up to you. You can set any number of stores. You just create new order cycles. You have the option here to um, add a fee. Um, I don't have a fee, but I have set up different fees. I have a discount set up because when we get into the season, I run a members only store and I would apply the discount to that store, for example. Um, schedules relates to, we have a feature where you can set up um, basically a, a standing order. If someone wants to order something and it's the same every week, you can, you can do that for the customer um, under, and that's what the schedules button means. So you set up the first part of the order cycle and then you have to ask what products do I want to sell? And so in this situation, I only have one supplier, that's myself. My own farm is supplying my own store. But if I had permission from other suppliers, like if I was a hub store, um, then I would see others in this drop down list and I could add their products into my store too. You can choose whichever products you want to add into the store one at a time, or it's often easier with a long list. I mean, this is close to 300 products I have. So I just do select all instead of going through one by one, for example. And then in outgoing products, we can all, you also select them. And the reason for this is people say, well, that seems redundant. Um, because what this is building, and you don't see it here, is that I might have a store where I have multiple distributors. So maybe I distribute my products through four different other stores. And in that scenario, I can list them as distributors. And that's why we have these two steps. And they might have different products because maybe I have a distributor that doesn't have refrigeration. And so then I don't put any of my refrigerated products into that distribution. Um, so distributors can have different range of products. We can get very fancy and tag. When we tag things, it means that only certain customers will see it. And so you can set up any kinds of tags in order cycles here. Um, and you can um, put, put details to the customer uh, for their delivery. So, uh, this phrase here is what will show up to the customer, and I'm going to show you this in a minute. Uh, you'll see this Saturday, May 16th phrase and where that shows up. And a little detail to them because right now with COVID, everything is curbside pickup here. So I will confirm to the customer their 30-minute window where they have to come to pick up their product. And I can add a fee if I want. So this, this is how we set up a store and I'll show you what this store looks like for my products in a second. We then also have the possibility to take orders. So once we have orders and what I'm going to do, I'm just typing in my farm name because there was some orders I was playing around and testing earlier today. So um, we can look at orders. You can edit an order. This is an order that uh, a, a customer made and it might be that I want to at this point um, delete this item I can delete it I can add a new num a new item I can select from items that were available in the store and add them um, there's all the possibilities of managing an order with different kinds of payment features if I need to make another order uh, this order is already paid so I can't really um, action it in terms of making another payment because there's nothing owing. But these are all the tabs that you use to manage an order. And I'll just show you uh, one of the nicer features I think is if you're at an order and you go under actions, you can automatically send an invoice or you can print an invoice. Um, if you print an invoice there, it automatically opened as a PDF file, for example. Um, but you could also just automatically email it or you can send the confirmation and so forth. So all of these are ways to manage an order and there are lots of tools for bulk order management that are even better um, because sometimes you need to do the same thing to a whole bunch of orders. Maybe you have 200 orders 
in your farmer's market and a vendor just um, called and said, you know, the strawberries are not available yet. And so they have to be taken off of everybody's order. And so what you can do is just, oh, this is hanging up on me. Um, what you can do is just search for, for the vendor of the strawberries or your particular shop name or your order cycle name, which is why that name was important. Um, and up will come all those orders under those filters and you can change them all at once just by clicking uh, which, which, which ones you want to change. Um, and you can also print bulk orders and there are features here um, for weighed items. So, uh, you know, when you go to a butcher or a deli counter or, or something like that, they weigh out the ham you buy or the cheese you buy. Um, and uh, then they have a little um, automatic pricing that goes on that package usually, and that's exactly what this is. So I have in the store maybe, you know, 200 grams of sliced ham that is listed, but when that's actually cut and weighed, it's very unlikely it's going to weigh out at exactly 200 grams. Instead, it's going to be 220 grams. So I just put in the weight. 220 grams, and it will automatically calculate the price, change the order, uh, change it on the invoice, um, change it in all the reports. So it handles variable weight, and you can do it in um, uh, pounds or, or metric. Um, and then there's a whole range of reports on the back end, and this is always very interesting because no matter how many reports we put here, there never exactly the report somebody wants. There is an unbelievable diversity in the ways that users need to see their information. Um, and um, we just kind of decided that we, we, you can't possibly have a canned report, a ready to go report that meets everybody's needs. So you'll notice that what, what we have are these data rich reports that if I want to choose a report and I'm just going to say garden party. Um, I can download it as a CSV file. So um, when I do that, oh, I have too many uh, other, um, just wait, it's hiding on me. Hang on. I have other Excel files open on my desktop over here. That's why it's not really it's perceiving a bit of a conflict. Let me try again. It will download as a CSV file, which is basically an Excel file. And then from there, here we go. Um, you can play with the categories and turn this into pivot tables or delete information you don't need. And I won't go through all the reports. Um, and we're in the middle of doing lots of changes to reports to make them even more responsive to people. But there's all kinds of reports. You can pick pack lists, you know, things that are meant for packers don't necessarily have detailed pricing information. They don't necessarily have um, the consumer uh, contact information, but a consumer totals report would have all, all that information. So it takes a, a little bit of time to make some fake orders and play out some reports and see which reports you really want to use. And then the last thing I'll show you is customers. So for any store, I don't know if I have any customers in my store because I've just been playing around with it. Oh, there we go. Um, as soon as someone buys in this store, they're uh, are automatically put in my customer list um, and I can tag these people to see certain kinds of information if I want, for example. Um, and there's also a report in here where I can download these customers as a CSV file with all their emails and then I can import that into, um, you know, an email program I might be using like Emma or MailChimp or many of these other products. So I'm going to start stop there. That's the basic overview. And, and I'll see if there's um, 
questions that people have for specific things you want me to show you. Um, I have one uh, question. The uh, informal food hub that I was talking about earlier uh, in my local area, it, um, it actually works like a food hub according to your system. It, they, they, it basically, it's just a whole street, a very long street in my town that has gathered together as a community to order basic products from a range of local independent shops. Uh, but they, they want to have delivery of each specific product on a particular day, like for example, bread. All the, all the bread orders arrive on a Saturday. Now, is there, how easy is it to collate the orders? Is it possible on, on your platform to collate the order for a specific product into one big order for that product? Yes, it, but what okay. you're describing yeah. would be you would you would list as an enterprise the baker who makes the bread would be an enterprise and either they would list themselves or someone in your group um, would list for them. That often happens that um, producers uh, prefer somebody else sets things up for them sometimes. Sorry, I'm getting hung up here. Uh, but they would be listed as an enterprise. They would create a profile. Their products would be listed as products, just like I showed you with my farm. And then um, they would set up a store in order cycle. You would order, and all their orders would be collated at the back end, and you would print off a report that showed you all the orders of that supplier and where they went to it and how they were going to be delivered and the addresses and all of that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly uh, that. I, uh, um, uh, I think um, I, I missed that slightly. Can you explain briefly about the actual collating, um, exactly yes. how that's done? Uh, so consumers put together um, orders, they order in the store, and then the collating happens behind the scenes. And so you just print off the report you want. So for example, um, trying to think of, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, maybe I could show you um, an order cycles consumer total. And I'm just gonna go to something that has, that I know has data that uh, will populate here. So I'm going to a older date range, but you know, you it doesn't really matter you just put in the name of your hub. This would be the name of your baker, for example, and you would uh, um, download the report. And so here would be your report. This would be your baker's name and each customer's name, each contact information. Um, and then whatever information you don't need, you, you could just kind of delete here, but how is it being shipped? Is it pickup or was it delivery? That would show here and you could sort by that column, for example, and then it would have the customer's um, billing address as well as their delivery address and their emails and their phones, for example. So then you would have all of that um, organized on the back end for you. All right. Thank, thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, that's great. Other questions? Teresa, this is Laurie. Uh, just with just to follow up on Andrew's question, would it also be possible to create an order cycle that only included the bread products? Yes, yes, uh, and, and in fact, that's easier if there are different products that are uh, particular timed to certain days, like the baking day is Wednesday or whatever. Then that would be a nice way to do it. You set up a store for baked goods where people order on Wednesday. You set up another store for the other goods which are available on Friday. And so when the consumer goes in, and uh, I'll just, I'm not sure if I know of a enterprise that has multiple stores open right now, but you'll see a drop down uh, beside any multiple stores. I'm just going to show you. Um, I'm just getting my own enterprise here because I'll show you that store, but my enterprise is not visible on the network right now because I'm still getting ready 
when a, when a producer is getting their store ready, often they make it invisible, right? So that people don't see something before you're ready to unveil it. Hmm. Here we go. So what I'm doing, I'm just going into the profile for my store, my enterprise. Now, you might remember when I showed you this screen before, it didn't have shipping methods, payment methods, enterprise fees. That's because I'm now set up to sell as a store. And so I have to, I have set up all my, what payment methods will I take? Um, will I take an add-on or a percentage fee? How will I do delivery, etc. But what I wanted to show you is you see, I've checked not visible. So, um, that means that in that front screen, the shop now screen, I do not show up in that screen. I will, when I'm ready, I'll put visible. But meanwhile, you just pick up the URL and you can put that URL in any, any place you want now, right? In social media, I put it on my Instagram feed, for example, because flowers are all sold by Instagram. Um, and uh, here's what the store will look like. Even though it's invisible, I just gave us access to it by going right to the link. And what I wanted to point out to you is this. When I was setting up the order cycle, you might remember this phrase appeared Saturday, May 16th. That's the name of my offering, if you will. Um, and this drop down, you could have any number. So I could have be taking orders simultaneously for you know, Saturday, May 16th, bread, um, you know, Monday, May 17th, uh, dairy products. Um, you can put whatever text you want here. It could be a date. It could be members only. It could be wholesale. Um, it, it, these, this is your space to figure out how you want to um, have people go to your stores. And if you tag people, you can make some of the stores visible to some people and not to other people which we often do with members only kind of show stores. Other questions? I have a question. Uh, yes. What about a subscri subscription to a, a basket, for example? How do you? Yes. Uh, so, okay. so, um, so a basket could mean lots of things. Um, yeah. A vendor sometimes creates a basket and they don't, the consumer doesn't have choice in it, right? It's kind of like a grab bag or this is this week's basket, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's listed as a product. So we have a vendor here, Bailey's Local Foods, and they put together an organic grab bag, they call it, every week. It has the same value and it shows at the top of their store. People just buy it. Um, in the product list, when you check out um, and, and run your reports at the end, um, that shows up as a grab bag, exactly what you listed it as. And so um, then you put together the, the um, whatever you're going to put in it, right? You have to make sure you have that material on hand. And, and then for things that are more like CSAs, where people buy... Um, uh, a program for, for a period of time for a season or something. Generally, the way people prefer to do that is they have two shops. I, so I would have a, a shop in which I'm selling my CSA shares and it would list as products all the different shares people could buy, full-time, part-time, etc. Every week, every other week, whatever I want to describe. And then once someone has bought a share and becomes a member, I tag them into a members only shop so they now get into a special space um, where they might have other offerings to them um, and they no longer come to the general public shop space anymore um, so you can manage your csa subscribers in in that way as well um, what is not possible is the kind of a box program where the customer chooses which products they want in, in their box this week. Or often here, there are market style kind of pickups at CSAs where the customer picks, um, you know, three squash items, two leafy green items, 
uh, for onion family items. Mm -hmm. That kind of a system, we do not support that kind of a selection system right now. But if you're just selling a box, it's just another product. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Teresa, could I just ask about um, the management of product availability when you're operating a hub? Do the producers have the autonomy to manage that or does that fall on the hub manager? And then secondly, just about the whole money trail um, when yes. customers make payments, so, where does the money go? Yes, so in a store, the money goes to the coordinator or the store owner. All the money goes to the store owner. Um, the store owner then needs to pull a report that will let them figure out how much money to send to all their vendors and how they're going to pay their vendors. Are they going to run accounts? Are they going to wait for invoices? Are they just going to pay them every week, etc.? So all of the, those dynamics are just like a regular face-to-face -face store in that sense. You have a relationship with the vendors around payment. Um, in terms of how you actually get products into a store, there is a, a thing here under enterprises. So all of the enterprises who you might want to buy from, you search for them on that first screen on the um, map to you see if they're already have product lists on the network. Because if they do, then nobody has to enter them again, you see. And so then um, if, if you found them, you go to enterprises and permissions and you contact them to ask if you can sell their product. So we don't just take products, but we get permission to sell products. Um, and then once you have permission, so for example, this, this bakery, Ambrosia contacted me this morning because she received permission from this supplier, Berries Asparagus, to sell in her store and she wasn't sure what to do. And so so what she does is she writes their name here and her name here. So Barry's Asparagus permits Ambrosia for whatever they're going to permit. Um, and then we set up these permissions for her. Um, in this case, I did it because Barry's Asparagus uh, has deferred their permission granting authority um, to Open Food Network. Um, but it might be that this supplier, EB Manor, they would go in and they would say, yes, I'm now going to sell to this store. And they, they decide what permission they're going to give the store. Is the store going to be able to just add to the store? Are they going to be able to change the products? Are they going to be able to edit the profile of the supplier? You just, the, the producer chooses which permission they're going to give. Once there are permissions, and we work in a system that has producer sovereignty. So the producers own their products and the producers give permission over their products and only the producers can do that. So um, once that happens, when someone sets up an order cycle, um, I'll just go into here, the example I was just giving, um, she would set up whatever she needs to call the orders. Ah, uh, it's not gonna, I have to go. Hmm. I don't want to mess with her order cycle. Let me just see if I can find one that is a multi-vendor store in here. I'm sure I can. Let me just do this. So I would go into the order cycle. This order cycle has general settings already. We can set uh, dates or whatever. Here, um, we're calling it Friday's market, and it has certain dates set. And then when we go over to incoming, we'll see that it's going to take a minute to load because she has all these vendors set up who have given her permission to carry their products. And with each of them, she can decide which products she's carrying, for example. So this is quite, I think there's 85 vendors here, so there's a lot. Um, and if there's new vendors, oh, here's a new vendor. We can add them. And then you can select which of their products we want, we want to include, for example. So all of this is um, you know, quite 
onerous because with that it's you know like it's a big store um what we do with a a, a a hub of this size, this hub in particular, is we have an option to um, import all the products instead of entering them one at a time. And so there's an import feature here. You basically just download the template for how you're going to have to organize the, the product list for all those suppliers. You enter it onto a spreadsheet and you upload it once and it's done. So this is an easier option when you have a big store with a lot of suppliers. I know it's a lot. It's an ambitious platform. There's a lot of features here. Um, the nicest features, I think, that set Open Food Network aside from others is the ability for that supplier to have their product list digitized in one place once and then any number of stores or hubs or buying clubs or themselves um, can carry those products and they don't have to be uh, entered separately so if you think of it in terms of a local food system um, how fast that moves local product uh, very quickly because right now every time i sell to a different uh, market or a different store, I have to adjust inventory separately and I have to figure out how much I have to pick for that particular store versus that particular store. And now on Open Food Network, I manage everything in one, one inventory, one countdown, one place. It's much simpler for producers. So just to double check, that means if I'm a, a seller with five pots of jam selling to five separate shops, <laughs> and each shop sells one pot of jam, the overall total is zero. You know what I mean? Like the, the yes, amount you, of product I have, yeah. Yes, you actually have more flexibility than that because you have the choice. You can set up a pooled product list so that, um, and we're talking about dynamic real-time countdown. So if it's bought, it's subtracted. If you add another one to stock, it's added. That all happens right. in real time, um, like to this, but second real time. Um, you can set that as it's pooled, so all the shops you're selling to count down from the same product pool, or maybe you have some special shops, some special friends who yeah. you want to make sure get the limited stuff. You can allocate to their inventory specific numbers. Okay. And they can take your prices and add a markup, or they can override your prices and do a, a pricing that is basically a suggested consumer price, for example. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. okay. We're just a couple minutes from one, so I will start to wrap up here. I want to thank you so much for... Um, I want to thank you, just reading the chat, I want to thank you so much for joining. Um, as I say, the user guide is a good place uh, to start. If you are working with um, uh, a particular group, um, it's good to get them all together. And if you need to book a specific thing, either your instance in your country or um, if you're in Canada, I'm happy to build a, a you know, book a specific orientation that focuses just on the enterprise type you want to you want to have as well. So yes. thanks so thank you so much. I hope you all have a very pleasant uh, rest of your day. Thanks a lot, Teresa. It was really thank interesting, you. and I, I will reach out for you uh, for the co-op. I was told, telling you Perfect. about. Perfect, and and that would be an an example where if if they wanted to um, onboard, and there were other people who wanted to see more details, we could we could arrange a specific. Uh, targeted kind of orientation. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Right. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Teresa. Bye, that was so amazing. Thanks so much. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>